Hey Rebels, my name is Matthew Barton. Welcome to the Rebellion Brewing Podcast. Fina Nelson is a scientist, researcher, and a brewer who's plugged into the Saskatchewan craft beer scene. She's doing cutting edge work with yeast research and development, and she's a strong advocate for women in beer. The arc of her story runs from geology to genetics, but she's still making kick-ass beer, and that has me asking so many more questions. So let's get into it. Fina, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's nice to see you. For the uninitiated, for the people who aren't your mom tuning into the episode, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> so, as you said, I'm a researcher um, and I've just started a PhD uh, in the last year here at the U of S in the food and bioproduct sciences. Um, but the best thing about this PhD is that it's a MyTax industrial partnership. So, I'm combining our research at the university with practical brewing stuff at 21st Street Brewery. Um, so it's it's this great partnership that really brings innovation from the university and from the lab into the craft brew scene um, and really getting the expertise from the brewers themselves. And recently we just got money from the uh, Agricultural Development Fund from the Ministry of Agriculture. So we have a lot of people who are really pulling together on this project and I, I love being the bridge there. I love that you've brought together academia breweries, government, ag. How, what did you do start with first? Brewing, academia, being the bridge? <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've always been a science nerd, um, you know, the, the kind of kid that never stopped asking why. Um, and I, I initially went into geology because rocks are cool. And um, then I fell in love with geochemistry and sort of environmental and analytical work. Uh, so I was really excited to to be solving problems in our province, looking at contaminant transport, um, looking at some of our industries and how we can do better. And and after doing some analytical work in uh, in geochemistry, I ended up doing analytical work in plant sciences. So instead of looking at groundwater, I was looking at plant extracts. And that was uh, a fantastic job working working in plant sciences. And the lab next door was uh, Chris Eskew's lab. So we would have coffee in the hallways and he would tell me about his amazing research, uh, which is nutritional genomics and looking at how nutrition and cells interact. And so we, you know, we ended up going for beers and I just sit with my jaw on the table listening to <laughs> the, the incredible research they were doing. And um, then he called me into his office one day and said, do you want to do a PhD? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> and then he told me, well, it's the beer project. And I had heard about this beer project and it was just something I couldn't say no to. So I... I got the offer on Friday and by Monday I was resigning from my job and jumping in with both feet. <laughs> so it's been a roller coaster, but um, my curiosity just keeps taking me to new places. For the uninitiated, tell me, help me unpack the idea of a multidisciplinary approach to these problems. Cause it sounds like you and Chris didn't start in the same place academically. Right. Yeah. Like I, I don't have a background in genetics, um, but I, I have a strong analytical background. I understand how to, how to set up experiments, how to design them and execute them properly. Um, and then how to, to really have good quality control when it comes to your analyses. So that's sort of the, the angle I bring to it, um, is that problem solving and, and real detail oriented side of things. Um, and then, and then Dr. Eskew brings in his, his genetics research and then Casey Murray at 21st street, um, the brewer there, he brings in a whole nother set of, of expertise. So we really have this fantastic team that when, when we sit and start addressing a question, we really get 
all different perspectives on on that question and it it gives us some really novel ways to solve those problems you join up with chris how did you get linked in with casey so chris actually um ended up just really enjoying 21st street beers and um he'd he'd go down there and he started to talk to casey and they they started to just bounce around ideas about research and science and and once once they had decided that they were going to do this project they needed somebody to come on and uh i was i was asked if i wanted to join so i was quite lucky you talked about frame of reference or perspective can you can you give me an example of a question or a topic within the research where Chris or yourself or uh, even Casey brings a different way of looking at a problem and somehow finding a solution or even just kind of blowing your mind with their perspectives? Yeah, especially like when you coming from a lab environment, we have a lot of control over what we're doing. Um, like Chris is working with with petri dishes, with individual cells, um, very tight controls on what's going on. Um, on the other side of things, with Casey at the brewery, um, as as much as brewers try to have a lot of control, there's so many variables that um, it ends up being a little bit more of of an art and a feel for what's happening. So. Having those two very different backgrounds, um, then trying to solve the same problem, we end up with having quite a bit of um, of detail oriented talk. And then, well, wait a minute, we have to back up a little and look at the bigger picture here. Um, and at the end of the day, what I'm really interested in looking at is how are the how are the yeast behaving? You know, I'm a yeast psychologist here. <laughs> um, and, and that has to take into account the details of, of the genetic expression, but also it's, it's a big complicated system that um, most people I don't think really have that much of, a, of an understanding of how complicated a commercial brewery really is. It's, it, yeah, it's four ingredients, but um, the, <laughs> the expertise brewers have is kind of mind blowing. One of the things that we've been struggling with is trying to explain to people that beer is a living, breathing entity. It's an ecosystem unto itself. And that plays into storage and freshness. And we're trying to articulate it in a way that isn't super nerdy, but in in a, a sense and in words that the average person can understand. Keep your beer in the fridge before you drink it right the the longer it sits out at room temperature or hotter uh damages it and can introduce off flavors or make it act funky uh <laughs> you can activate that yeast and maybe you'd have an explosion <laughs> or uh, cardboard you know the kind of oxidization effect and i we're always talking about how we can make it understandable in about one sentence but the nice thing is I get to bring on people like you and we can dive deep into the nitty gritty. So I also wanted to make it clear though, you're not just like pushing pencils on paper. You're in the brewery, getting your hands dirty, getting your feet wet. How, what's that like? Yeah. Half my time is spent on campus in the lab, lab coat glasses, doing the nerdy thing. The other half of the time is, is spent at the brewery hauling around kegs, doing packaging, um, milling grain. And it's, it's fantastic to have these two sides of, um, you know, a lot of computer work, a lot of detail oriented stuff, but then, you know, like I, I can lift a 50 liter keg now. That's not something that most PhD students can do. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun to, to be able to really, um, get inside at the brewery and, and learn all the details that are involved with brewing. Um, even like sanitation is huge and it's not something that, um, you think requires expertise, but it really does. 
I was talking with Zal and the boys and Vanessa uh, a few weeks ago, and he was telling me that, well, he's always said for years that brewing is 10% brewing and 90% cleaning. And then we were talking about CIP systems, uh, clean in place system. Cause I was saying, well, how do you clean the inside of a keg if it's a fully contained sealed thing? And so he's explaining, wow, we'll do this with the chemicals. We'll do that. And he was saying some days they'll use acids and some day they'll use bases and they have to switch it up because the yeast or the materials evolve or grow or do something unexpected and can become like resistant or immune to acid. So they're like, instead of creating a super bug that's immune to acid, we're just going to nuclear, nuclear blast it and make sure it's dead with something else. <laughs> yeah. And the, there's a lot of different microbes. So what works on one isn't going to work with another one. Um, and I mean, luckily with beer, it's kind of an inhospitable environment for, for most other microbes. Um, the yeast really outcompete. But um, yeah, there's a lot of chemistry going on there too um, that is interesting to bring from the lab into, into my experiences then at the brewery. I had this terrible nightmare scenario where we're constantly fighting with and struggling with our yeast. And I'm thinking, man, what if the yeast mutates to a point where humans can't do make it make beer anymore? Like yeast goes off and goes crazy. And Zal's like, well, we're, we're trying to manage that responsibly. <laughs> and I was like, I got to ask Fina because she's going to be a, way more smart about yeast than I ever could be. <laughs> Well, I, like I'm still, I'm still pretty early on here, um, but yeast is is really you. You got to think of it like livestock. It's it's been domesticated, and it's it's we've selected for the type of yeast that wants to make beer. We have, you know, they're they're like our loyal border collie. <laughs> they want to work with us. They want the beer, um, and and we want it too. So. Yeah, there's there's potential for for us to end up mutating strains that don't make good beer, but then we just don't pitch them again. So um, it's it's really been this shepherding um, sort of evolution with with beer, and the the strains that make the best beer are the ones that keep getting used. Um, and there's there's always some farmhouse in Norway somewhere who's going to have a strain if we run out. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking like there's thousands and thousands of strains of yeast and I'm only aware of maybe a handful that are used for beer is is that going to be the case forever or are we going to develop something new like how does it work well like yeast is is a really interesting organism just in general um because it's it's used in the laboratory quite a bit as well um as a model organism looking at you know, anti-aging properties, um, or it makes insulin for us now, or or other vaccines, like it makes a hepatitis, um, I think hepatitis C vaccine, as well as they've they're starting to develop COVID vaccines by by yeast. Um, so we've got thousands of of laboratory strains, and then we have all these brewing strains, and then we have the wild strains. <laughs> so there's just an incredible amount of diversity. Um, and I think, I think as brewers, we're probably going to keep chasing the new strain. Like what, what can we do um, with the yeasts we have and, and where can we find new ones? Um, I'm specifically interested in just just looking at the genomes of, of five strains that are used at 21st Street um, and then how to train them to do what we want rather than actually changing anything about their genome. But uh, genome editing is is a thing and there's there's there, between genome editing and and breeding, there's unlimited possibilities with yeast. Now you've triggered a question in my brain that makes the reporter slash scientist in me go, okay, let's nip some crazies in the bud. Cause when you say genetic modification, immediately my mind goes to the nonsense with GMOs and the fear mongering. 
should, um, and this, maybe this isn't a fair question to ask you, maybe it's for the philosophers, but to me, genetic modification of organisms in a controlled environment is okay. We're not going to be putting it into the food supply and just willy nilly mutating humans or whatever. But from your perspective, what are you seeing with, when you say genetically modified, what do you mean? And what are the implications, if any? <laughs> right. So there's, like, we've been genetically modifying them for, for thousands of years, right? And, and we can do some of those things in the lab now um, and speed it up quite a bit. And I think, I think it's going to be quite a conversation to have with the public um, about helping them understand what different types of modification can be done and, and what risks they hold. And I think, so this does lead into some of my science communication work with um, trying to rebuild that trust between the public and, and scientists. And I think it's really important that the public understands what our motivations are. Um, why do we want to make a new yeast? Um, would that benefit brewers? Um, would it be solving a real problem? Or is it just something that we want to try because we want to try? Um, I, think, I think the public really should have a voice in the conversation. Um, but but they, have to, they have to understand a lot, a lot of the basics so that they can be part of that conversation. When I was sitting down talking with Chris and looking at his published work, and reading those articles, my brain's cooking and I'm curious and I'm looking at it so I can envision a scenario where the public takes a version of that information or a perception and runs with it and it's inaccurate and scientists, no offense, have not done a great job of communicating simply to the public <laughs> in an effective manner. Like it's, Oh, it's frightening because I've read things and I'm like, that's, that's, you're saying the scientist guy wrote X, Y, Z, but really he wrote one, two, three, but you're too dumb to read <laughs> or craven or political or whatever. They're or just don't have the background. Yeah. How yeah. do we fix that? <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Sorry. That's not a fair question. Uh, no, I think, I think that's, that, that is, so as academics, we tend to write papers and talk to other academics and it, it tends to be kind of a closed club because if you don't understand the jargon and you don't have the background, um, you, you really can't access that information in a clear way. So it is a scientist's responsibility to be able to, to boil down what, their research is actually saying and communicate it to um, either scientists in other fields or non-scientists. And I think it's, it's really a responsibility we have to communicate the problems that we're solving, the solutions we're coming up with, um, and things like what, what does science actually look like? Is it, is it beakers in a lab or is it, you know, pulling yeast samples from a fermentation every four hours for two days <laughs> um it, it can look like rubber boots just as much as it can look like you know safety glasses sometimes i i you know we do marshmallow and spaghetti science with my kids and we do these little fun experiments and they themselves are like these little curious natural scientists and then i was trying to explain to somebody the marshmallow thing and I said, you yourself can engage in an act of science. And you know what the most fun part is? All you have to do is line up like six or seven beers and sit down with your friends and taste and talk about them. I was like, sensory analysis makes you a scientist. You're doing the act of science. And they're like, what? <laughs> I'm like, it can be that fun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I I think just curiosity can can really um, just bring so much joy to your life. You, you stop and look at, you know, that that tree. Well, why did it grow that way? You drink this beer. Well, what gave it to this flavor profile? You know, we 
we do talk a lot about hops and and grains and stuff like that. Um, and I would like to start talking more about what the yeast is bringing to the table. Um, and that's absolutely legitimate science. <laughs> what beers are you digging right now? Oh, I am. I'm almost a fan of anything made with quike. <laughs> Um, that, that's just stolen my heart. Um, but I, I just like to try anything that's weird. Um, I guess, I, I guess I just want to ask the questions, right? Um, and, and. (sighs) Kvaik beers are tough. Like they are challenging. Like my first Kvaik beer, I was like, I gotta, I gotta rinse my mouth. (laughs) Oh, you don't care for them. <laughs> well, I don't know that I don't care for them. I know that the handful that I, the first handful that I tried uh, had like a vomity character to them, but the latest one I tried did not. It was more fruity. So I'm in my mind, in the back of my mind, says I haven't found one that's for me yet. And I think the brewers at the time, the the breweries who are supplying these beers maybe hadn't dialed it in because your beer shouldn't taste like vomit regardless. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, wet goat, but, uh, <laughs> maybe not vomit. <laughs> um, yeah, the quake is one I'm really interested in actually checking out what its genome is like. Um, and seeing, cause it just, it, it makes me chuckle to think that a Norwegian yeast makes tropical fruit flavors. Um, so what's, what's going on there? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you'd also started plugging in more people. I saw that you did a pink boots brew. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Um, when, when I first started getting involved in the brewing scene, um, Obviously, it it seems like women aren't as well represented. Um, so I really wanted to to get involved with other women in the brewing industry, and and I found the Pink Boots Society, and they are just a wealth of helpful information. Um, so they do a collaborative brew every year. I believe you guys did one. Uh, so. I was able to gather um, a bunch of female scientists from the lab here and bring them into the brew house. And they were hands on. They were in there with the paddle and (laughs) they were really enjoying the brew. And then they were asking the science questions that they would be asking in the lab. You know, why is it doing this? What's the mechanism? And and it was just such a great collaboration um, to have Casey walk us through all of that and then to have another set of fresh perspectives in there and also to to introduce women who might not have ever brewed beer to uh to showing them that it's it's not intimidating it is something that everybody can do so what uh what kind of beer did you brew for pink boots so we made a my bock and um we named it after my personal hero uh, hildegard of bingen I don't know if you know her. She's a 12th century abbess from Germany and she was a polymath. She, she wrote philosophy. She wrote natural science. She wrote medicine. She wrote hymns and plays. Um, And she actually is the first person to record the use of hops as a preservative in beer. Um, And then she went on to be the founder of modern science in Germany. So we thought it would be really appropriate to have this handful of, of women scientists make a really hoppy beer uh, and name it after her. I love that whole story. How did it turn out? It's still, it's still conditioning. Um, we just dry hopped a week ago and we're just waiting for things to settle up. Um, but it's, it's going in a real good direction. I'm excited for it. <laughs> um, and, then, and then when it's done, we will be, we'll be packaging it. And um, we'll be throwing a fundraiser to launch it um, with funds going to um, Pink Boots Society, as well as Sanctum 1.5, which is an organization here in Saskatoon that helps uh, HIV positive and at risk mothers um, with their newborn babies. Can you unpack that for me a bit? What is, tell me more about it. 
Um, Sanct of 1.5 um, is a Saskatoon organization that gets involved with people who are pregnant, um, who are also HIV positive or at risk. And they, they have a home where they can take in these people and um, get them the medical care they need, both pre and, and post labor. And it's a phenomenal organization that's really helping some of the most vulnerable in our community. Are, so are they a small group? Are they, are they fairly big? I've never heard of them before. It's a fairly s- small group. Um, I think they only have room for, I think, 10 beds in their home right now. Um, but but they are growing and, and they're gaining a lot of support in the community for the work they're doing. So they're helping young moms uh, make sure their kids don't get infected with HIV or... Right. Yeah. Um, cause there's, there's a lot of care that needs to happen. Um, when, when someone who's HIV positive is giving birth, um, to make sure that it doesn't get transmitted to, to the infant. Um, but there's also a lot of struggles that happen after labor. Um, many of, many of these people have issues with addictions that make it difficult to be a new parent or maybe didn't learn how to parent on their own. And, um, it, it can be it can be a challenge for any new parent. So um, there's there's some special needs here that are that are addressed. I remember reading in the Leader Post literally uh, a day or two ago. Maybe this is something that kicked off uh, your line of thinking. It was saying the average person who's infected with HIV needs about one point three million dollars in medical care. That's medication and care in Saskatchewan per year. And it was basically saying if we adopted a, a harm reduction model, we every infection we prevent from ever happening, we save millions and millions of dollars and reduce strain on the healthcare system. Wow, I I hadn't heard that, but but yeah, never mind preventing pain and suffering to a human being. Um, it makes economic sense, then, doesn't it? I I don't know how to articulate for people that. It's not just out of the goodness of your heart. It's good for your pocketbook too. <laughs> like, I This is going to be the cynic in me. I think we're in this, um, I'm going to editorialize, a moral landscape that is not very in touch with what humans need. And we're more valuing people for what their economic output is or the burden they put on the system. And trying to say, well, it's just good to be a good human, to do a good thing, to help people is not an argument that flies in this current social, economic, political climate. And so I always kind of default now to framing it in economic terms, whether people like that or not, and maybe it's crass, but <laughs> like... I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, no. no, I think I think it's a, a fairly compelling argument because um, empathy is something that's really hard to to teach and to to instill in people after they've already um, maybe maybe started to see the world with a little less compassion. So the economic arguments is is fairly compelling for um, maybe the more rational side of of human thought. <laughs> but I just, I hope that we all do the right thing because it's the right thing. But <laughs> well, I got to say when I was researching your work and seeing what you were doing on social, um, I was just inspired by it. I was like, wow, you're doing such cool stuff. I can't wait to talk to you on the pod. <laughs> Well, thank you. I hope that my my joy and enthusiasm comes through. Um, I just enthusiasm is so infectious that if I can get a few more people interested in in asking some questions, that that's that's a win. Do you think you're going to do another Pink Boots Brew next year? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, it was it was a ton of fun this time around, and um, we'll make it bigger and better next year. This was my first time organizing one, so it was it was quite modest, but plans to do another big one next year. Yeah. Uh, we also to celebrate International Women's Day, uh, we had a ladies' beer tasting. 
So um, we gathered 13 women together and we got ourselves a BJCP, uh, Leanne. And she led us through through some of 21st Street's beers. Um, and it was it was a wide range of of women, uh, those who didn't like beer and didn't know if they liked beer to those who who had done tastings before. And um, Leanne is so good at, at bringing community to everything. So it, it really was a, a fantastic group of women um, that we're going to be meeting regularly now to taste beer and and share our lives. I love it. <laughs> I've literally personally gone to beer tastings where somebody will be there and say, I'm not a beer person. I'm just humoring my partner or my husband, whatever. And by the end, they're like, oh, maybe I am a beer person. <laughs> Yeah, and I think just being mindful about what you're drinking can really change your experience with it. Um, if you if you just think I'm not going to like this, well, you probably won't. But um, when you're mindful and you actually start to pay attention to some of the flavors and aromas, there's there's almost something for everybody, um, unless uh, you know you have allergies or something like that. <laughs> When it comes to the research you're doing with Chris, when can people expect to see, touch, taste the results of your work? Well, I have been assembling a sensory panel um, for for some of my my research. Um, that'll probably be in a year or so. Um, we'll start evaluating some of my small beers and then hopefully two years down the road we'll have some full-scale fermentations that I get to uh, have played with the yeast before they went in. <laughs> nice. If people want to find out more about you, the work you're doing, or even your Pink Boots collab, say they want to sign up, they're in the Saskatoon area, where should they go? Um, so the SQ Lab does have a website. And I will have to get that to you. <laughs> I've got those links. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so the SQ Lab does have a website. Um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Brew for Science. And um, you can always send me an email if you just want to nerd out sometime at fina.nelson at gmail.com. Uh, I would love to have a beer and uh, get you involved in however you want to get involved. Oh, Fina, thank you for your time today. Thank you. I hope this was helpful and that uh, your listeners enjoy the uh, the random musings of my mind. <laughs> I'm so glad I got to have you on the pod. It's It's been great. <laughs> <laughs> and it was lovely to chat with you. I've listened to you on the podcast, so it's nice to put a face to the, the voice and to actually have a conversation with you. Cheers. All right. Take care. Rebels. Thanks for listening today. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, be sure to join us on our brand new Facebook group page, The Rebellion Brewing Podcast. I'm also proud to let you know we're members of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network. It's a one-stop shop for tons of locally produced shows from across our province. You can find them at saskpodcastnetwork.com. I'm going to include links to all things Fina Nelson in the show notes. Be sure to check it out. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped, so you don't miss out on the latest in Sasscraft beer news. Thank you for joining the rebellion.